When Masa Amini was arrested and killed by the Iranian police, civil unrest broke out in the nation's capital of Tehran. But what was this whole thing about? I'm Laura Youngblood, and welcome to From Laura's Perspective. At least three times a week, I post a new video essay breaking down either a current event like I am today or a facet of music, movies, TV, business, industry, food, drink, politics, or what have you. If this is the kind of content you're into, smash that subscribe button and bang that notification bell to join my video essay library and have your phone go off every time I add to it. Today, I'm going to discuss the arrest and killing of Masa Amini, the protests it led to, and the consequences of said protests. Now let's get started. Ever since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the Iranian government has run almost in complete correspondence to Islamic law, which includes requiring all women to wear a hijab, the Islamic religion's trademark headscarf, at all times in public and in a very specific way at that. This law made violence and harassment against women wearing the hijab incorrectly very common. But Iranian women weren't exactly complacent about this, especially not in recent years when Muslim women in general have adopted a more liberal perspective of hijab guidelines. But the Iranian government was not having it and started to use even more extreme violence against women who did not comply with their laws about hijabs. On September 13th, 2022, a shy, reserved 22-year-old girl named Masa Amini from the province of Kurdistan had come to Tehran to visit her younger brother, when she was arrested by the Iranian morality police, known as the Guidance Patrol. While in their custody, Amini went through a briefing class, which consisted of being physically and verbally tortured to the point that she lost her vision and fainted, requiring her to be taken by ambulance to Kasra Hospital. While in the intensive care unit, Amini was in a coma for two days, then died on September 16th. It was while Amini was in the hospital that Iranian civilians took to the streets in defiance of the guidance patrol and their hijab laws. Amini had barely been declared dead when protesters, who consisted mostly of women, began to chant, I kill whoever killed my sister, outside of Kasra Hospital, and several were arrested and pepper sprayed by security forces. The protests did not stop or even pause during Amini's funeral the next day. In fact, it was while Amini was being buried that attendees defied the Iranian government by using such phrases as death to the dictator and removing their hijabs during the ceremony. Later that day, the protests spread all the way to Kurdistan's capital, Sanandaj. In Sanandaj, protesters chanted, Sakez is not alone, it's supported by Sanandaj, and set fire to tires, threw rocks to riot police across clouds of tear gas, and tore down posters of Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. By September 18th, Students at Tehran University were holding placards during a protest rally of their own. On September 19th, the government cut off cell service in central Tehran. Nonetheless, the protesters persisted, and as of the next day, they'd spread to at least 16 of Iran's 31 provinces. This was the day that were known as flash protests 
began to emerge, which formed and then dispersed quickly so that security forces would have less time to intervene. One such example of this was when a woman in Kerman was filmed removing her hijab and cutting off her ponytail during a march. On September 21st, Amnesty International received intelligence that the general headquarters of the armed forces ordered commanders to severely confront troublemakers and anti-revolutionaries. By September 21st, Amnesty International confirmed the killing of at least 34 protesters, all through use of unlawful means such as birdshot. It was on this day that the government issued a widespread spread internet shutdown and restricted the only two mobile apps allowed in Iran at the time, WhatsApp and Instagram. This shutdown included mobile providers cutting off their users' internet access from 4 p.m. local time until approximately midnight. While pro-government counter-rallies were held in Tehran, demonstrations were held in Canada, Italy, Sweden, Turkey, and my home country of the United States, to show solidarity with those protesting Amini's killing and the Iranian hijab mandate. On September 23rd, after days of heavy fighting and clashing, the protesters seemed to take control of many Iranian cities, including Tehran and Ashnave, despite denial from the Iranian government, forcing universities to close and switch to remote learning. There were more pro-government and counter-protests in Tehran, this time with phrases such as death to America and death to Israel being chanted, putting blame on the aforementioned countries and the unrest taking place within them, as Iranian clerical rulers often do. At one point, they even went so far as to call anti-government protesters Israel's soldiers and claim they wanted them executed. Beginning the next day, Iranians who'd emigrated to cities such as Berlin and Melbourne began their own marches in solidarity with Amini and those protesting on her behalf within Iran. Beginning the next day, Iranians who'd emigrated to cities such as Berlin and Melbourne began their own marches in solidarity with Amini and those protesting on her behalf within Iran. The next day, UN High Commission for Human Rights spokesperson Ravina Shamdasani urged Iran's clerical leaders to, quote-unquote, fully respect the rights to freedom of opinion expression, peaceful assembly, and association. With hundreds of protesters arrested and security forces going so far as to respond with live ammunition, the organizing council of oil contract workers threatened to strike if this kind of backlash against protesters continues. If this threat were to be fulfilled, it would cripple Iran's oil sector, which is hugely important to the nation's economy. Perhaps the single most violent incident on the timeline took place on September 30th, which has actually already been dubbed the Zahedan Massacre or Bloody Friday. Although the protests happening in Zahedan that day were still about a meanie, this rally in particular was sparked by reports that a police chief had raped a 15-year-old girl in Chabahar, whose identity was publicized by the Friday imam three days prior. Protesters stormed police stations, which resulted in officers opening fire on them, resulting in the deaths of 40 civilians. In early October, as international protests spread through major world cities such as Auckland, London, Melbourne, New York, Paris, 
Ottawa, Rome, Stockholm, and Zurich, a new slogan for these demonstrations, Women, Life, Liberty, was adopted. On October 1st, Iranian authorities fired bullets in the air to, pro to disperse protesters at Islamic Azad University in Tehran. The next day, protests were held at the Sharif University of Technology, during which the police repeatedly shot at students and even trapped and detained those whom Iranian Minister of Technology Mohammad Ali Zulfigal could not help escape. On October 4th, teenage girls in multiple cities were filmed removing their headscarves, chanting anti-government slogans, and blocking traffic, an unprecedented show of support following the mysterious disappearance of Nika Shakarami at a protest 10 days earlier, who was then confirmed to have been killed by security forces. By the next day, Iran's oil ministry had still not followed up on their threat to strike if security forces did not stop using live rounds and tear gas, which they had not. However, Iranian petrochemical plant workers made a similar public threat on October 10th and blocked the road to the Bashir petrochemical plant while chanting, Death to the Dictator. On October 12th, senior conservative politician Ali Larajani called for a re-examination of Iran's mandatory hijab laws and acknowledged that these protests had deep roots in Iranian politics and had nothing to do with the U.S. or Israel, as many government officials had theorized. Three days ago, on October 15th, a major incident took place at the Even Prison in Tehran, where many protesters, journalists, and political prisoners have been detained, particularly since Amini's death and the beginning of the resulting protests. Videos showed the prison on fire and background noise of explosions and bullets, all while prisoners had attempted to escape. Slogans such as, death to the dictator were being chanted and police infiltrated the interior of the prison. Family members of prisoners were gathered around the prison while this was happening, also chanting death to the dictator, only to be tear gassed by the police. In this atrocity alone, four inmates died and 61 others were injured. Amini's death and the resulting publicized protests have evoked reactions both from individuals and governments all around the world. Reza Pahlavi, the son of the final Shah who was ousted in the 1979 Iranian Revolution, called for additional pressure on the Iran leadership, including the expulsion of diplomats, the freezing of assets, and the creation of a strike fund to compensate workers. He stated, Women may decide to wear or not wear the veil, but it ought to be a choice, a free choice, not imposed for ideological or religious reasons. Former Iranian football player Ali Karimi voiced support for the protesters and called on the Iranian army to side with them. He also shared technical advice on how to circumvent the internet blackout. Fars News, per partially affiliated with the IRGC, called Karimi the new leader of the opposition and called for his arrest. Marjane Satrapi, author of the graphic novel Persepolis, which depicted Satrapi's life during the 1979 Iranian Revolution, described the protests as beautiful and inspiring. Satrapi said of the protesters, what I have lived, the youth is living now, and that there is nothing more beautiful and inspiring than their courage.
In my home country of the United States, President Joe Biden sent in his floor speech to the United Nations General Assembly that Iranian protesters have our solidarity and implored them to secure their basic rights, so to speak. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan took to Twitter and called Amini's death unforgivable and promised that we as a country would quote unquote continue to hold Iranian officials accountable for such human rights abuses. Switzerland's foreign ministry claimed that they were quote unquote dismayed by the high number of victims in relation to the protests of the violent government crackdowns on the protesters. Swedish Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson urged the Iranian government to quote unquote refrain from violence against these protesters on the grounds that freedom of expression, association, and peaceful assembly must be ensured. The next day, Swedish Foreign Minister Ann Lind also stated that Sweden stands firmly behind the women and people of Iran that are peacefully taking to the streets in solidarity with Masa Amini. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern stated on October 3rd that she was deeply concerned to see the loss of life and of course just generally what we consider to be human rights issues as they relate to women and girls. Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid said in his speech to the United Nations General Assembly that young Iranians are suffering and struggling from the shackles of Iran's regime and the world is silent. They cry for help on social media. They pay for their desire to live a life of freedom with their lives. Lapid said of the Iranian government that it hates Jews, hates women, hates gay people, hates the West. They hate and kill Muslims who think differently, like Salman Rushdie and Masa Amini. As I've mentioned, international human rights organizations such as the UN and Amnesty International have also reacted to the atrocities surrounding Masa Amini. In response to violent crackdowns on protesters from the Iranian government, the Human Rights Watch has raised concerns regarding reports that authorities have used tear gas and bullets to disperse protesters. Amnesty International has stated that the Iranian authorities have repeatedly shown utter disregard for the sanctity of human life and will stop at nothing to preserve power and has called on UN member states to urgently establish an independent investigative and accountability mechanism for the most serious crimes under international law committed in Iran. Thank you all so much for watching. Masa Amini was not the first Iranian woman to suffer violence at the hands of her government over hijab laws. And unfortunately, she's probably not going to be the last. But Amini is not just another statistic. She was a wonderful woman who cared deeply for others and has had a profound impact on her friends, family, and country. The best we can do now is stand with the men and women who are publicly standing up for Amini and women who suffered sim similar fates and encourage them not to give up even when the authorities resort to violence as they have. If there's ever a major event like this happening anywhere in the world and you'd like me to cover it in a current events essay, you can always request it in the comments and I'll do it because this stuff is important to me, as I hope it is to you. And of course, you can request video essays on any of the topics I do, including history, music, movies, TV, food, and drink. If you liked what you saw today, 
Check out the links on your screen for even more. And if that tickles your fancy, smash that subscribe button to join my video essay library.